Welcome to the Intelligent Investing Podcast, where modern portfolio theory can suck it. A student of the school of Graham and Doddsville and a clergy member of the Church of Warren Buffett, here's your host, Eric Schlein. Good morning. You are listening to the Intelligent Investing Podcast with Eric Schlein and we have Brian Lingus on the show. Welcome, Brian. Thank you, Eric. Good morning. Thank you for having me back on. Yeah, good morning. So I wanted to talk about the uh, Brookfield uh, Oak Tree uh, deal and wanted to get your uh, thoughts and perspective on it. Yes, yes. Uh, it's it's. Uh, I saw a headline or, or somebody mentioning in the news that it was uh, – uh, a perfect the the uh, similar in the investment world it's similar to a Hollywood marriage it's uh, Angela Jolie uh, getting hooked up with Brad Pitt now I know they, they have broken up since then but our marks uh, you know this is to the brightest mind in the investment community uh, tying up getting together uh, Albert marks I mean he's a well-known figure uh, I'm sure you 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 know he's always on TV his uh, letters, his books are all, I mean, they're must read. I mean, his letters are, are full of insights. Uh, you have to read them. And uh, and Bruce Flatt, the guy that runs uh, Brookfield Asset Management, uh, more reserve, more under the radar. But uh, for people in the investment world, he's he's just as expected. And, you know, like I said, you got two, two of these great minds coming together. And they have a, a perfect fit. Uh, it's it's uh, you have a yin and yang situation where, you know, Albert Mark can have anybody he wants, and Bruce Flat can be with anybody he wants, and then you know they just come together, and they really complete each other because, uh, uh, you know, uh, Oak Oak Tree, <laughs> Oak Tree is uh, the one that's uh, being run by Albert Marks, uh, is in the the distressed debt business, the credit is a business. It's an alternative credit uh, manager, and uh, Brookfield, Matt, Brookfield is in the uh, uh, all in the alternative asset management, but they're mostly focused on real estate infrastructure. So Oak Tree needs more of what BAM has, and BAM needs more of what Oak Tree has. Um, so that's a, it's an easy. I mean, on paper, it looks like a great deal. Looks like a great matchup. Uh, you don't have to justify anything uh, uh, and uh, I'll try to do three things I'll, I'll, I'll go over qu- quickly over the deal just explain the uh, a little bit the numbers here and uh, why are they doing this and I guess the third thing I want to do is um, I mean what does this mean right so uh, just to explain to people listening here I'm sure you heard the news uh, Brookfield is buying 62% of Oak Tree uh, and the management at Oak Tree, Owen Marks and company, uh, Bruce Catch and Jay Wintrow, the guys managing the funds, they're going to re- keep 38%, uh, the rest of the company, basically. And uh, Brookfield, I'm just going to call it BAM by now. That's the stock. Um, they will, they can buy the rest throughout the years, and I think they can own the whole thing by uh, 2029 at, at the uh, earliest. Um Brookfield is offering $49 to uh, Oak Tree for share. It's basically a 60% premium over the 30 uh, day uh, average. Or uh, the uh, the investors can also elect to have 1.077 uh, Brookfield shares, which, uh, you know, if you have to pick, I recommend. Take oh, the buy, shares, yeah. Take a share, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so uh, yeah, just to be transparent here, uh, I have shares in uh, Brookfield Asset Management. Yeah, uh, so, so do I. Uh, but I don't have anything in Oak Tree, uh, so I mean I, I follow over the marks uh, and uh, some of this stuff, but uh, I never had or never bought anything Oak Tree related. Um, so basically, the combined entity, Oak Mark plus BAM, was at it's 475 billion uh, asset under management, 475 billion dollars, almost half a trillion. You know, we're getting there. We're talking about half a trillion. Within a year, they'll probably have it. They keep raising money like they do. And uh, their expected fee-related earnings is $2.5 billion, which is a lot of money. And we're not talking about uh, 
uh, distributions. We're not talking about carried uh, interest here. We're just talking about the fee on the fee-related earnings. Um, and uh, again, on the deal, uh, both companies are expected to remain uh, independent. Uh, they're going to keep the brand. They're going to keep the people. They're going to keep the investment team. And uh, Brookfield is getting two seats on Oak Tree. Oak Tree has 10 seats, and, and I'm surprised that uh, Bam will only get two. So I guess they're really committed you know, to keeping them independent. I know, I know a lot of mergers and acquisitions, they're like, yeah, we're going to, you know, but they always end up screwing up everything. And this one is like, yeah, no, no, we're just going to get two seats on the board. And uh, Owen Mart is uh, going to have one seat on Brookfield. And for reasons that, well, they want it that way. They, they want them to be separate. And for regulatory reasons, uh, they, they also can't fully integrate them. Uh, if, if uh, well, why, why, you know, why are they doing this? Uh, uh, obviously, size. They are in the alternative asset management business, which size is everything, scale. Um, you know, why are they doing this? Well, more asset, man, more asset under management, obviously, more fees. These are the obvious one, but uh, it's not the main reason. The main reason here is talking. You're talking about product offering, right? So, if you're a client, who are the clients here? They are institutions, right? So pension plans and diamonds, serving wealth fund, um, you know, mega entities with a lot of money, and and they have usually what what they're facing right now is that they have too much money and they can't put it to work. And in the space where a company like Brookfield operates, size, everything, the bigger the better. And uh, uh, Brookfield then have the credit platform that oak tree has and uh, oak tree is one of the premier you know alternative credit management company in the world so oak tree can offer brookfield products now and brookfield can offer oak tree products so that way you know the the that's where the yin and again comes in and the yin and again also comes in with the culture management uh you know i don't think there's a lot of uh integrations to do here it's just paperwork and uh i think oak tree also uh you know oak tree only has wait sorry oak tree's been public for only six or seven years they you know they don't have a giant track record uh if you've been an investor for the last couple of years or since the beginning you know you, you can say you've been disappointed uh because the stock hasn't been following the bull market and, and there's a reason for that. There's a little bit of frustration here. Uh, Oak Tree is what you would call a counter-cyclical investment company. So what does this mean? Well, these guys are in the debt business, right? They are in distressed debt. They are in corporate debt, bonds, uh, bank loan, that kind of stuff. They are in a space where traditional lenders don't operate. And uh, a company like Oak Mart makes money when you know credit dries up when money is not available so you need a full cycle uh, a boom and bust a boom and bust uh to really see what they can do uh they've been in business since 1995 so obviously they've been doing well but i mean we're in a 10-year bull market here the i don't know i think they became public in 2012 and, and the market has only been going up since then and they're they're facing the the limo where too much money is chasing too few deals and they're very disciplined so they don't you know so what they've been doing lately is that they've been turning money to investors because they can't put it to work and uh, so you know they're, they're in a situation where the stock price if you're not you know how it is in this this in this in this in on the market if you can't offer growth if you're not offering instead growth or, or plan for profit or any of these things it's, it's hard to get that premium valuation. Uh, it doesn't mean that he was wrong. Maybe, uh, you know, in a two to three year period when if we ever hit that recession or that crash, you know, he's going to be in a position to, to, to take advantage of it. But right now, uh, it's just the stock hasn't been doing anything. It's been overing around 40, 42 bucks for a while now. Uh, so getting that $49 good now if you've been an investor for a long time and you believe in in the uh, oak tree uh, you know uh, strategy 
you may be snide enough, but it is where it is. You know, you can't just sit there forever and wait for for the whole thing to uh, fall down. Um, so that's that's what's going on here. Uh, um, you know, what does this mean? This whole Brookfield and tie up thing. Well, like I mentioned, uh, it's a size game, right? So Brookfield is increasing their asset under management by about 20%, which is a big number. Uh, it's an easy way and maybe a cheap, I wouldn't say cheap, but an easy way, an affordable way to increase your asset under management. It's win-win. Brookfield wins, Oak Tree wins. Uh, we're talking about best in class, meeting best in class. And I believe there's going to be a lot of embedded value down the road. Uh, you know, if you follow Brookfield like like I do, well, I know you do, but for our listeners, Brookfield is positioned for what you would call, uh, they are in infrastructure, infrastructure business, right? And, and they believe that we are in the early stage of uh, early stage of the bulk of the public infrastructure going from public hands to private hands, right? So, so ports, real estates, uh, power lines, pipelines, uh, all, all the, these giant infrastructure that, that are the backbone of the global economy, right? They're making sure that goods and everything are moving uh, that's Brookfield's business, and why? Why is this important? Well, tra- you know, you, you, you know this problem where every day we hear about traditional fund managers are losing, you know, ma- they're losing assets under management, right? All the money is going to ETF, passive strategies, and in a sense, I don't blame them. Uh, you know, passive strategies, I, I believe, have, have uh, uh, you know they have a space in somebody's portfolio. They're cheap. They're the you know the fees are low, and uh, they provide more or less market return. Brookfield does not compete in that world. They compete in the alternative asset management business. All the stuff I just named, right? Infrastructure and all these things. There's no ETFs for that at the moment, anyway. And the core of the assets are long life, durable assets with a cash flow. Now, I am an institution. I need to put money to work. Why? Well, bonds, you know, bonds don't provide any returns. And I have obligations. I have an obligation now to my, let's say, retirees or or beneficiaries. And I also have an obligation 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, six years down the road. I have to meet this obligation. I have to make sure that I have enough money today. And I have to make sure that I have enough money in 50 years. Now, I'm looking at bond returns, you know, after inflation, after taxes, there's nothing. So a company like Brookfield comes in and is like, hey, look, we have highways. We have all these things that's going to be here for another 50 to 100 years. Uh, and we're getting money for it, right? We have contracts uh, and we're getting paid every year. And this is our returns. Are you in? Sure. So this is where Brookfield comes in, and this is where a company like Oak Tree and Brookfield keep growing, 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 growing. And in this situation, there's only a few companies like Brookfield that can do what they do. Uh, why? Well, not anybody can decide tomorrow morning to build a dam in Brazil. You need trust. You need experience. You need a track record. Um, you know, it, it's you can't just imitate them tomorrow morning. It's almost impossible. Nobody, nobody will give you here's ten billion. Go build whatever. And not uh, only, not only do you have to have the capital, but you have to have the um, experience too, being able to uh, do that. Absolutely. Which is not an easy yeah. thing. Yeah. So institutions are not, you know, institutions not going to be like, well, let's manage, you know, a dam. They're not going to do that. They, they, it's not their business. But like, could, could, does could, you, could you imagine like CalPERS deciding they're just gonna like manage a dam themselves? Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, a lot of people will get flooded. <laughs> it's it's not their game. Their game I is. Had such, I had such a bad joke, and I was not gonna say it. Maybe I shouldn't say it. I was gonna say in, in California instead of wildfires, they would just have floods all of a sudden. Yeah, well, that's terrible. <laughs> it's really bad. That's not a funny thing. Yeah, well, that's why they should manage it. 
Yeah, exactly. And so yeah, this is basically, uh, you know, this this is the game they're they're, they're doing, and uh, uh, I think Oak Tree under the Brookfield Asset Management, um, uh, it's great. I think it's great. I think they can really work it out. And I think that uh, both of them together is uh, is a great idea. Uh, I don't know. What do you think? Well, I want to ask you, what, what are your thoughts of them issuing shares to do this? Uh, Brookville yeah. is issuing shares? I, are they? I missed that. I think so. I thought they said they were going to pay with the current uh, with available funds. Uh, oh well, they did say they will pay with uh, up to fifty percent shot. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, no, it's fine. It's not. I mean, it's cheap, right? It's not a big deal. Uh, it's what four, f- five, six billion, which is nothing for Brookfield. Brookfield is worth close to fifty, forty-five to fifty billion. So let's say half the uh, let's say the deal is six billion. Let's say half is three billion in Brookfield shares. Um, you know, they're not getting a bargain there. But they're not paying through the roof either. Just, so I think they're getting fair value. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think the key here is not today. It's uh, hey, can you still hear me? By the way, yeah, I can hear you yeah, perfectly. I, uh, awesome guy. I've been getting inspiration of poor connection, so just oh, never mind, it's gone. All right. Okay. So so uh, the real uh, uh, I think the real value here is down the road in four, five, six years. Uh, when these funds, uh, these private funds that let's say Brookfield runs, uh, are returning money to shareholders, when uh, you know when the uh, uh, because Brookfield is mostly cyclical assets, so when the you know they go up when the value of their assets goes up, but they're not you know are they protected during a downturn? You know, not as much as Oak Tree. So now they're offering almost well, look, no, almost nobody is going to be as protected as Oak Tree. That's right, Oak Tree's position for downturn. So now they're going to yeah. have a look. You know, twenty percent of assets is in credit, maybe even more because they they announced not too long ago a partnership with uh, a credit company in uh, Europe, LCM. I, I don't have it in front of me, but uh, so you know they they. Basically, they they position themselves. Look, we're a one-stop shop. You want credit? We have it. You want a building? We have it. You want a highway? We have it. Yeah. So you know, uh, you know what's interesting though is from an investor's perspective, people who buy certain stocks thinking I'm going to be more protected in a downturn, right? Yeah. There's, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily a smart way to think from a individual perspective. Uh, investors' perspective, because I think I'm, I think what you're saying is I'm trying to do some market timing where I'm not expecting the stock to fall as much, right? Because if you have a if you have a great business, you'll you'll um over over say 20 years you'll you'll expect you'll have a recession or two. Obviously, with Brookfield, right when 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 they're basically taking it private, right? Um, yeah. The one of the advantages that they'll have, right, is just having that uh, nimbleness and flexibility when there is a downturn. Um, I still think it's just as likely that, you know, the stock price of BAM, for better or worse, would go down just as much in a recession if they owned it or didn't own it. It just seems like it's like, you know, when there was people who thought that Berkshire Hathaway would be a good replacement for cash, right? It's like, well, it's not really a good replacement for cash when the stock can go down yeah. by 50%. Yeah. I, I never, you know, I, like, I, I got it intellectually. It was just more of the, um, this, this is just not how it works in reality. And and it's like, yeah. when people want to own defensive stocks, it's like, well, what are, you, what are you being defensive of? Are you being defensive that you think it's such a great company that it should compound for years and years? despite recessions, right? Because then who cares about owning, you know, a toothpaste company or something? Just look at great, great, you know, great businesses that, that will last throughout decades. And to me, that is a, um, that is a, um, oh man, I'm blanking on the word. That's a, uh, that's, that should be what I would call a defensive stock. But I think when most people talk about defensive stocks, they're talking about the short-term thing of I expect my stock to fall less than the market. I, I just, and that's just a ridiculous way of doing things. So, 
you know, people who um, want to invest with Howard Marks because like, oh, well, you know, this, the, the it'll be better protected in a downturn. It's like, yeah, it's true, but you know, it's a good chance it'll it, the, the stock would go down with with everything else. And um, well, there's so many layers. Are you owning right. stocks? Are you owning their products? And, and you know what a you know what are we talking about here? Uh, and is it you know there's so many factors. Are, are you talking about getting into oak tree during the downturn and then take you know them putting right. when it works? Right, so but, the, but again, it's... but again, the, the the rational way to look at that would be okay. What do yeah. what do I think would be some kind of you know normalized earnings? You know, do it. Are are they, are, they, are they really being hurt right now? Oh no, they own all this stuff. There's, they have all this dry powder. They're gonna have all this opportunity. Great, I'll I'll, I'll go buy some stock. Or, like that to me would be a business where, if I was an individual investor, you know, it might be a lot more attractive to buy in the middle of a recession when when things don't look so good and their their earnings are temporarily low, temporarily low. Um, because you know, well, this they're comes just back to investor to... behavior, right? Exactly. Like, this is where. You know, it, it, it's you know studies after studies after studies shows that uh, the large component of your returns have to do with how uh, has to do with the behavior of the investor. Now, even even with ETF, uh, people are like, oh, I'm not buying funds, I'm buying ETF, but they trade them like stocks anyway. Yeah, you want you want so, to hear an interesting statistic? There's um they done so they actually have done a lot of studies on this and. Um, they have, one of the things that's been shown, um, and I haven't looked at the numbers that have been updated in a few years, but you know when the market had averaged um, about ten percent a year, so I'm going back a few years now, right? Yeah. Um, the average uh, individual investment account only returned two percent a year. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. And that isn't that, that I was just having a conversation about this funny just a few weeks ago with my chiropractor and we were talking a little bit about this of just you know how it's just so silly to try to time things because you have to be right on so so you know in so many cases and it's just interesting how people really end up doing the bot the more buying when things are high and the the more selling when things are low and it, it still blows me away that number because it's so it's so staggeringly different yeah. than than the average. The market average ten percent. The average investor is like two percent or something. It's ridiculous. And yeah, it's totally you know forget ETF or funds or or whatever. It's people feel better buying stocks when the market's going up. It's a comfortable thing. Oh, the market's doing well. You know, it's been look. It's been up thirty percent over the last two three years. Maybe I should get it now. Oh, you know, look at Netflix. It's doing so well. I want to buy it now. You, it's part. You want to be with the crowd. You want the people. You know, to be surrounded. It feels good feeling. And you know that good feeling is one thing. Yeah. What is the opposite? Buying during a crash. Do you know how miserable that is? It's tough. It is really really hard when you buy something and every day it goes down. It goes down. It goes down. You go to sleep. Oh man, my money's gone. My money's gone. Yeah. You know, they, it, there's also. Sorry. Go ahead. No, it's a really tough thing to do with psychology. Most people tell you, yeah, no problem, no problem. They all tell you the same thing. And once you hit that crash, we had like that mini bear in, in what in the last fall. It's it, that what that was nothing. But you you've seen you know, when you see your, your your retirement fund melt, you know, can you handle that? And most people to most people will say yes. And the facts are most people can't. They just can't. Yeah. And uh well the other thing too is that um the you know if you look at say I want to compound money for 20, 30, 40 years, right? You're making a long-term bet on something. You know, in this case, this you know, either the the stock market averages or your stock picking abilities, right? Right. The the reason that you see there's the average stock market index returns and then there's the average returns of the individual, which are so much lower. I think one of the big reasons behind that is people generally are bad at making very long-term decisions. And 
you know, they've they've done. I've 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 done some studying around neuroscience. I'm not a neuroscientist by any means, um, but done some really really cool stuff in the personal development world that involves neuroscience. And one of the things that um, they have shown, which it's interesting intellectually, doesn't really make much of a difference, but um, when you're about to um, make a decision or do something, there's already those certain mechanisms in the brain have already it already show it basically it already shows up that you're going to do it before you're even conscious conscious that you're going to make the decision right so the the brain patterns happen first and then you <laughs> become aware that you're going to make the decision after and then you then have to justify why you made that decision so look at the look at it this way right you're saying okay I'm going to go play a 30 40 your compounding game, right? And then all of a sudden, in the midst of all of those years, you're getting all this short-term feedback, you know, every day, yeah. every week, right? And you look, think about yeah. it, think about it. You're a Brookfield shareholder. Was there ever a moment? Now you're 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 a pretty good investor, but was there ever a moment where? The Fed, you know, the the Fed of the United States goes, oh, we're we're probably not going to raise interest rates anymore this year. Was there ever a thought in your mind of, oh, I wonder what the implications of that for Brookfield is? No. Okay. No, I don't interesting, care. right? I I don't care. Right, you don't care. But here's this is what's interesting, right? Is, um, two things. Number one, my brain personally does go there, right? It's like, huh. Low interest rates, is that going to increase you know, more capital to pension funds and that going to give more assets under management to Brookfield over time, right? Whatever, right? But then the other part of me goes, okay, that doesn't really matter that interest rates are not rising. And I and then I ignore it, right? So I have to actually override that mental system. It's like an internal process. Um, and, and there's plenty of times where I just don't really read up on that stuff because it doesn't really add much value to me. Um, as an investor, right? Like a lot of that reading I do because I find it interesting and I like learning about the business climate, but not for the short-term effects. What I'm saying is it's very difficult for the average person who is not, or maybe even who is studying businesses, right? To take in all this feedback all the time and having these brain patterns automatically change all the time and then you're quote unquote now you know quote unquote reevaluating your thesis, either to the upside or to the downside, when really you should have just stick to that original decision, and not worry about all the mental processes going on internally because the stock market isn't really you know the the intrinsic value of the business isn't changing based off your mental processes. I I think some people are wired for this and some people are not. Most people are not. And uh, I'll give you an example. I have I have a good buddy. I'm not going to give his you, name, think, but uh, well, uh, I'm I'm going to challenge you on that, Brian. I, what's up? I, I think that there's there's a there there maybe there's a wiring for this, but I think a lot of it too is are you are you able to have the awareness of what part of your what part of the human wiring or human machinery is actually relevant right you know if if the market goes down 50% right there's no it like it's like okay yeah you know I'm running a business it's not the greatest thing but at the same time oh cool there's a great opportunity to raise more capital and finding all these great ideas so any kind of long any kind of um crappy feeling I might have about that gets overridden very quickly because I have a different I have a different lens or context of looking at that situation than say someone who sees it and goes, you know, I've just lost half my money. Oh my God. Right. So that's like, you know, there's that, that that's like the first level. Right. But then there's that, you know, um, as, as Howard Marx talks about the first order and second order thinking, right. The second, this, the, the, the second order thinking is, Oh my God. Things are down. Oh my God, this is awesome because everyone's scared. Okay, if everyone's scared, maybe there's opportunity. And these things look so horrible, but everyone also thinks these things look horrible. And you know what? This is way more horrible. 
then it's actually making it out, you know, then, then, then it's actually being reflected in the stock price, right? The stock price are, are, are way, way more down than the intrinsic values. Therefore, this is an amazing opportunity. Now I'm excited and giddy. That's, that's the second order thinking. And mm-hmm. it's not that I don't think people are, I think everyone is capable of, of being able to do that. I think as a society, we're really bad at teaching people how to think. I think I think a lot I think a lot of it has to come do with that. Well, we are flooded with you know short term thinking uh, buttons. You know, look at social media, look at the media uh, papers. Everything is reaction, 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 reaction to what's going on right now. Yeah, but and Brian in the nineteen fifties, probably it was too, just to a large extent. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was, but I think today is hyper. It's hyper. Are we rea- react right now to what's going on? One minute, people make investment what they see on Twitter. It's it's they have their phone and buy and sell, um, you know, uh, pieces of paper, whatever. People are, are, are. I really think the time horizon. Yes, it was the same. People are more, let's buy some bonds. And you know like bonds where you buy and you hold it for X amount of years uh, or GICs or whatever. You know, and then stocks became a thing, really, 80s, 90s, mutual funds came out. Uh, and then just fast, the new cycle is faster, faster, faster. Uh, look, it, it, right now, I think if you have, give yourself, and, and you know, an honest assessment, if you give yourself a time horizon of one year, you have you're ahead of the game. I, I think if you give yourself a year, a year and a half, uh, you are you, you know you you doing yourself a huge favor compared to people that are trading on the next quarterly earnings, which is what most people are, which is what most funds are, what most edge edge funds are doing. They're compared month to month, uh, quarter to quarter because they they have expectations to meet and. Uh, it's a very, very tough game, but investors like me and you, we're not playing that game. We're in a different field, so we can look one or two, three years down the road, and uh, it's not an easy thing to do. Again, it goes back to the behavior, the patience. But it's also uh, it's, it's a conscious choice to do that. You know, whether whether you have a natural wiring for that or not, I I think it's a na- it's a, what what it is. It's a choice to do that, and it's an it's having an understanding and a certain kind of perspective of, of of what's going on to be able to make that choice. Oh, and that first and second order thing example you used to do, that's very Howard Marks. That's, that's <laughs> what I was saying. That's, that's, that's what Howard Marks talks about. Yeah, it, it's a very Howard Mark thing to do. But yeah, most people uh, don't think that way. It's, you know, I, I am in the camp where most people are wired that way. Uh, can you learn it? Maybe. I don't know. Uh, you know, everybody can take the book, investment book, and read it. We all read the same things. We learn the techniques. You learn your approach. You, know, you learn how to value things. You learn about industries. You learn about business. Everybody can do that. Everybody can learn that. And then the next level, it's it's behavior. And that's deep. That's that's wiring. That's, I, I, I'm not an expert. I, I, th- I think, though, a lot, a lot of that has to do with the, the, the people you surround yourself with. I mean... If you're in the uh, the value investing community, which is pretty tight knit, <coughs> yeah, and you're around enough people that think like that, right? It's it becomes easier to think like that. It's it's uh, I don't know if it's easier because that community is very small and they can't attract each other. Like it's not like you get a couple people together. Hey, you know what? We should think. Long term, no, it's it's it is one person worried that way, and that person's worried that way over there, and then they kind of cross bat and like, hey, you know, we're you know we're alone in our world. So just think, yeah, but think about like I know for me, I you know if I bring someone to a Berkshire Hathaway meeting who's never been before, and it's like, oh wow, this is this is you know that was my experience, right? It's like, oh wow, this is an entire world that exists. It's it, yeah, it's different than just. You know, when I went to my first Berkshire meeting, it was very different than having read about Warren Buffett for, you know, a few years prior to that. 
there was something different about being in that community, being in that milieu, which you just can't replicate from a book. Yeah, it's uh, you know like you, 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 do, you do fitness, right? right? Fitness? Yeah, right. <laughs> you, you 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 do weights and, and competitive. Yeah, stuff, I work right? out. I work right. out. Yeah, 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 that's what I mean. So fitness. <laughs> I don't. What, yeah. do, what do you want me to call uh, it? Weightlifting. Uh, yeah, I, I work out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I know fitness for me is very aerobic, so not jumping up and down. Oh, uh, oh, okay. That's not what I'm looking. At. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I I don't do, jump up and do down you, all day. But do you jump rope? <laughs> no, I don't do that. Do you I'm not good a, at it. Do you it. wear a headband? Okay. Um, but you know what? It's interesting, right? So, um, one of the things they say is that if you want to get in really good shape, go surround yourself with people who are also in really good shape, who are you know taking care of themselves and working out yeah. a lot, right? You know, yeah. the, it it just this becomes an it becomes a new a baseline. There's there's a whole emotional and physiological experience that happens when you put yourself into that kind of environment. Um, there's a reason yeah, if you're sure. a, there's a reason if you're an athlete that you're always around the team. You're you're always a practice. It's it's not just about the practice. A lot of it has to do with being in that social community, right? We're so, we're social creatures, and we and we we take on the traits yeah. of the people around us. It's just it's inevitable. You, you're a product of your environment. Uh, yeah, you know, you, you, what is the expression? Uh, birds flock. Like birds, birds of, are the bir- same. Birds of a feather flock together. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I am much that. Yeah, you know, you, you, when you see a group of friends, you know, you see like four or five people together. Uh, it's rare that you'll see one of them being a smoker. You know what I mean? Like smokers will hang out with smokers. Yeah. Yeah, like, do, do you ever notice that? You're not going to have like a group of 10. No, nine of them don't smoke, and one of them's like, yeah, I'm going to have my cigarette now. It's very rare. No, well, they again, they, they've shown that even cigarette smoking, there's a huge social component to that. Yeah. Uh, I think that person number nine that is smoking will most likely quit because he, he'll be influenced by the rest, uh, the rest of the group that's not smoking. Uh, no, it's the same with fitness. You know, I, I, I fitness. Now I'm using that word. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> no. I, I look at my, uh, uh, I don't know, gym buddies. I guess. Yep. You know, we, we uh, uh, you know, uh, I have a workout partner. Uh, we try to, uh, uh, you know, I have a coach and all these things, and we. We know we, we, we talk the same language. We uh, always talk about how we can improve uh, certain things. And uh, but yeah, it doesn't feel awkward. I'm I'm not like an outside, you know, element looking in. I just fits right. It just fits right. And the people that come in, you know, that that it just there's an yeah, it's a natural environment. We're a product of of our environment. And uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, to go back to Orange, I'll give you a, a quick like one minute story. I, I have a buddy of mine, uh, you know, a good friend. He uh, hits me up like a year and a half ago on the phone. He's like, "Hey, uh, you know, I got some money. I want to invest. You know, you're an investment guy." I'm like, "Okay, great." I spent that night two hours on the phone with him, the in and out on investing, margin of safety, buying a business, stocks, bond, the whole thing. You know, what account? You know, you want tax free this? All that uh, we, you know. Back and forth for two hours, good conversation. Yep. And then this guy, this guy's not Mr. Investment, right? Like, it's just it's all new for him. And then I, I'm, late, you know, Investment 101. I, I'm doing it for him. You know, it's for the long term. It's your retirement fund. Blah 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 blah. I get a text from him the very very next morning. This is the text. <laughs> what do you think of Bitcoin? <laughs> and I'm oh like, my god. And I'm like, oh. I, I'm looking at the text. Did you listen to anything I said last night? It's. Uh, I'm like, oh, that sounds same. And some people, and then it's the same guy texts me an hour and a year later. What do you think of pot? You know, <laughs> it, it's. Uh, it's not. He's a great. You know, he's a smart guy. Uh, we went to school together. People he's don't. A great friend, but. Uh, it's there, not there's everything. some. There's some people that also just don't want to do the work. Well, or they may want to make it more complicated than it has to be. Like someone like that, he should just go buy an index fund and just not worry about it. That's it. That's, that's it. it. That's the solution. 
That's what I said. That's what you, you do. Should, you don't... That guy shouldn't even work with an, with an investment manager because then he's going to be badgering the investment manager all the time. Like he psychologically just shouldn't do it. Oh, you don't want him as a client. No, you, you don't want him no, as a client. No, no, They're no, calling no. you every other time. Like, oh, what about pot? What about Netflix? What about Bitcoin? What's the next thing? You know, it's 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 that's, um... that's the kind of money you you should turn down. Yeah, I I, I I mean, I used to be in the personal management business. I, I used to get those phone calls. Mm-hmm. I, 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 you know, I remember a Friday afternoon, it just just an hour before I closed shop, you know, it's Friday. I get, I get a phone call from, a, actually, it wasn't even my client. It was somebody else's client. I get a phone call. It's emergency. Emergency, it's urgent. Her, her advisor's not there. She just needs some questions. I'm like, oh, all right, great. You know, I, I take the phone call. And she's like, oh, my God. Look what happened to Greece. It's like 2011. Mm, I'm like, well, what about Greece? It's like, well, well, what about what happened to my portfolio? I'm like, oh, I, you know, I go over things. I'm like, you, you don't have Greece. You don't, you, your bonds, your GICs, like, what it, what did your advisor told you? But that's that's the thing. It, even if your advisor do all the work, like I did with my buddy, explain for two hours what you should do. Uh, she called like, Friday. She's like, oh, okay, Greece, nothing. I don't have Greece. I'm like, you, you don't, you don't have Greece. Go to, Go have a glass of wine, go to bed, you're fine. <laughs> but it's like, you know, what happened? It's Greece, you know, and then the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. And it's, it's, could part you, of it is. Could, could, you, yeah. could you imagine a farmer waking up one day and seeing the whole thing in Greece, and this is like a farmer in, like, Kansas, and it's like, oh yeah. my god, my crops, look at Greece. <laughs> <laughs> We're soybeans! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But that's 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 just an example of how how people react, right? Greece is in the news now. Oh no! Yeah. <laughs> Damn it! If you're, if you're, if you're managing a, a you know an apartment building, oh, I wonder if my tenants are going to leave now because of Greece. Yeah, I, I remember, man. I pull out her file. I pull out everything. What is she talking about, Greece? I, I don't see. You know, you have that oh, money man. is guaranteed. That money in these bonds. You know, it's all most of it's all guaranteed. I'm like, hey, you're fine. Don't worry about Greece. She's like, are you sure? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you, you know, know nope. I, I wanna... oh, oh no, here's Greece. You're, <laughs> you're screwed. You know, it's like, oh no, you have Greece. You know, it's like, no, it's, you you're know, fine. <laughs> I'll add a comment to one of the things I also like about this deal. Just going back to this for a second. Yeah. Is. You know, Bruce Flat talks about, you know, we're going to have a recession at some point. At some point, the assets we're going to buy are going to go through a recession. The fact that they can be, you know, essentially they can they can now do more things at more times is always a really good thing. I, like, I've always thought one of the one of the competitive advantages about Brookfield is a psychological one. You know, when they say there's always there's always some market in the world where it's good to be, where it's the stress, where it's good to be a value investor, right? So, like, you know, you look at them investing in Brazil as an example, right? Where there's been a lot of the stress in Brazil. Yeah. It's easier to be patient when there's, in your circle of competence and expertise is in so many markets, you know, instead oh, of just yeah. waiting for that one thing. I mean, oh, I yeah. think Howard Marks, the fact that he stopped taking capital because he had less places to deploy it. The guy is super, super patient, right? Like that's great. Yeah, he's returning money. He knows. Yeah, like, yeah. He's very disciplined. So, so very, as very a, disciplined. so, if you're a shareholder, it's kind of a weird. It's kind of like a weird situation because on one hand you want to grow the business, but here's a guy who's not growing the business, and you know, not, you know, it, at yeah. least not not to the point that I'm sure he would want, right? So now all of a sudden, Brookfield has an additional lever they can now pull. Especially when things get bad, um, yeah, yeah. So I, 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 that aspect of it, I think, increases the, the psych, the psychological, um, moment, yeah, if you will. So in other words, now there's an additional thing to do, but you're never forced to do it. You know, Buffett writes about one of the things he likes about arbitrage is that it makes it easier to hold a short-term position without being forced to think you have to use your cash right away. So well, it's, it's the same. It's, I think it's a very similar psychological um, advantage at play. Yeah. I. Uh, what do you think? Should, no, no I, t- I absolutely agree. Uh, no, totally. Uh, over Mars in position, like he's returning money now, 
And when he needs money, if he needs like five, ten, twenty billion, he makes a phone call. He he'll have it, it instantly. Yeah, he's not gonna have to, you know, you know, cold call, <laughs> you know, trying to convince people. Uh, no, and that's also why the partnership's so great is that he can call a guy like Bruce Flat and say, "Hey, we're seeing some major opportunity. Let's go start a new fund." Or, "Hey, I'm starting this fund with you know." There, I don't know what the synergies are going to be, but you know, even though they will be independent businesses, there will be synergies. And having a yeah. ha- having a guy like Bruce Flat in your corner, who who is going to get your way of thinking, is the num <laughs> the most important thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here we go. Yeah, <laughs> little, little plug in. Uh, yeah, over the marks because he'll need he needs it. That was uh, actually very unintentional, and I just as I was saying, I was like, "Oh, wow. the most important thing." Uh, yeah, the uh, no, this is a, this is a very very good fit. It's it's hard, you know. I, I t- it would have been hard to see over the marks. Like I don't think he was trying to sell. Like I, like he mentioned, he, he mentioned, he, yeah, we weren't trying to sell. I think it was in a uh, Global Mail interview. Uh, no, we weren't really trying to sell, but then we got approached and uh, I think he talked to other people to see, you know, but then it's like, yeah, this, this is a great fit. This is just, it fits very well. It's like two pieces of puzzle coming together. Uh, yeah. Any, any yeah. other thought that I think we've covered most of this? Is there yeah, we, we talk a lot longer than, than, than I expect. I'm like, how? <laughs> like, I was looking at, I made a little bit of notes this morning. I'm like, okay, well, this is going to be 10 minutes. I'm not sure what to say. And then there we go. Uh, we've been, what, 45 minutes into this? Um, so for people that have a long ride home or, uh, you know, some free time in the weekend, then they got material. You know, why go on Netflix when you can listen to this podcast? I don't know about that. Thank you. <laughs> well, you, can, <laughs> you got, what, 70, 80 episodes you can binge listen? I think this is what fifty three episode oh, 53. 50, something like that, yeah. Well, you're fifty three, okay, so you're uh all right, cool. Yeah. Well I have to let you go. <laughs> Sorry to end on that note. No, that's, I got so I, I got something coming up. Uh, but, I I, uh, I had to go too, that's why I was saying if there's anything else you wanna say we should we should wrap it up. So That's it. Let's see in a year. Uh, Well, this deal is going to close in in the third quarter, apparently. But let's see in a year, in 1.5 year, two years at least, uh, see what's up with them. I'm sure this won't Uh, be the last time we we bring this up. So (laughs) It's good. All All right, right, man. Pleasure talking to you. Yeah. All right. Have a great day, Brian. Thank Thank you you for listening to the Intelligent Investing Podcast with Eric Schlein. If you'd like to connect with Eric for questions, comments, feedback, ideas, or to inquire about being on the show, please contact Eric at intelligentinvesting at gmail.com. So, in the words of Charlie Munger, I have nothing to add.